and we are very lucky to have back with us live in the studios this morning, Dr. Stephen Bezruchka and Dr. Stephen Gloyd. Dr. Stephen Bezruchka is a senior lecturer at the University of Washington and works as an emergency room physician here in Seattle. He spent over 10 years in Nepal working in various health programs and teaching in remote regions. Dr. Stephen Gloyd serves as Director of Education and Curriculum Activities in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. He is also Executive Director of Health Alliance International, a Seattle-based nonprofit organization that provides support to ministries of health in Mozambique, East Timor, Ivory Coast, and Sudan. And they are both speakers at the conference that is happening this weekend, War and Global Health. Tell us a little bit about the conference that uh, you both helped pull, put together. First of all, thanks, Mike, for inviting us. Um, this conference is a, um, a special conference held every year, um, put on by the students at the University of Washington, primarily the students in the schools of public health and the schools of medicine, um, that's a Western Regional International Health Conference. And um, this year they chose to address the issue of war as a public health issue. and. Um, I think both Steve and I find this to be um, particularly uh, appropriate um, given the fact that war has an enormous impact on health, illness, mortality um, around the world, and yet it's rarely been taken seriously as a public health issue, and particularly as a public health issue we can do something about, um, particularly thinking about the fact that you know, war really is responsible for the loss of huge numbers of lives, and we can deal with issues uh, like, say, smoking or cancer prevention as part of our public health um, approach. Uh, but we haven't typically done this with war, um, which has, uh, if not equal, probably uh, much greater importance. All right. And it may seem obvious to everyone, but uh, wondering if you can give us a brief definition of war. Actually, I, I think most people, when asked to define war, would uh, really stumble. Um, War is a collective effort that societies do um, that requires advanced planning, uh, is violent in which deaths are going to be expected. And, it, and it's something that is done to redress something, or there's a reason for going to war. It's a collective effort. Deaths will be expected. It also implies that we are by nature al an altruistic species. That is, we, uh, we look out for one another, because otherwise, why would uh, uh, sentient beings go off into battle knowing that they might be killed if we weren't working for the greater common good? It's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, now, war is quite distinct from, say, homicide or, or killings, which are uh, something that an individual does to somebody else for some reason. And then there has to be a redress. And countries decide to have a redress, usually, typically in the form of capital punishment, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Um, homicide is not looked upon favorably, but war is. So wars are good, homicides are bad. Capital punishment is a redress of homicide, and, and there's some 34, 37 countries still left doing it, we being one of the major ones. But you don't see that with war. You don't see it, capital punishment or even uh, prison sentences uh, handed out for the, the country that, that loses the war or starts the war. Well, we do actually. No, that's important. Uh, you remember the movie Fogs of War uh, by Robert McNamara? It was a, basically uh, Robert McNamara, our former defense secretary, uh, CEO of Ford Motor Company and head of the World Bank, reflecting on, uh, on, the, uh, on the Second World War. And he, and he was asked about uh, the firebombing of Tokyo, you know, something that we did to destroy that town uh, because we knew it was made of wood and it would burn, and uh, roughly 100,000 deaths due to that. And we, we think of the atomic uh, bombs we dropped, but uh, firebombing Tokyo. And, and, uh, and Robert McNamara reflected, you know, if we'd lost the war, we would have been tried as war criminals. Instead, we won the war and we were heroes. All right, so address the idea that is uh, we hear a lot in the society is often repeated that we've always had war and we'll always we always will have war because that's just our nature. So what would the evidence, how would you look at that evidence? Um, well, 
For most of human history, that is where we have written records, we have records of war. But for, you know, human history exists for about 5,000 years. And yet we've been a species on the planet for, um, it's debatable, 100,000, 500,000 years, a long time. And during that time, we have no, that I call that prehistory. In prehistory, we have no written records. All we have really are bony records. We have records of skeletons, burial mounds, uh, evidence where people may have lived. If you look at that evidence, there's not as much trauma, bony trauma evidence, as there is once we made the transition to agricultural societies uh, and, and civilizations. So there appears to be less skeletal evidence of trauma uh, for the 95% of human existence that we lived as hunter-gatherers, forager societies. And then uh, you begin to see more records in the, in the modern era of a lot of trauma. So uh, in, the, in the Enlightenment in the uh, 1700s, 1800s, uh, people talked about the noble savage, the, our primitive being as being kind of existing in a, in a better state than, uh, than subsequently. So uh, the question then arose, well, do these noble savages go to war? And some people have said, well, when we look at hunter-gatherers in the last century, they have a lot of trauma. They kill one another. So small groups, uh, a couple of killings, so the actual rates of homicide are pretty high. Um, and then you ask, well, is, is this in, what characterizes warring among hunter-gatherers in the last century? And that's been studied, and basically what happens is uh, there's a variety of social factors that happen. Uh, one is, um, do they marry outside their group or not? If they form uh, alliances, Outside of the group, then power gets diffused. If they marry within the group, then power gets concentrated. Do, is there a payment for a, a bride price or a dowry? Once you have economic exchange involved in there, uh, then there's a more tendency for these hunter-gatherers in the last century to, to fight one another in groups. Uh, if you have um, a more sedentary and food storage issue, once you have people storing food, then there's concentrations of, of resources in the last century, and then people will fight for those. So uh, this guy, um, Kelly, said, uh, who studied warless societies and the origins of war, said, you know, you had to have... Um, societies that were less nomadic, they had to have economic exchanges for marriage partners, uh, they had to uh, marry people within their clan, uh, and they had to store food. And then you had the, the uh, sort of conditions that would make warring more likely. And then you can sort of extend those ideas to the present circumstances and see why war might be a common part of our existence. You know, it was uh, Thomas Hobbes back in, uh, in his book Leviathan, he said, uh, you know, before civil society, life was a, uh, uh, was a war of all against all, and life was nasty, brutish, and short. <laughs> and uh, I think we can say that that was not the case for most of human existence. That is, uh, life wasn't as short as when we made the transition to agriculture, and uh, it wasn't a war of all against all. So we can be a non-warring species. I think that's how we're, we're actually biologically put together. Let me add to that. Um, not only can we not be a warring species, but I think that we've seen in the last couple of centuries, which is my sort of scope of history, <laughs> that um, things have changed a lot in terms of w the amount of war and also I think some of the causes of war. If you think about the 20th century alone, there were six times as many wars as in the 19th century, six times. And that's really surprising. Um, the um, numbers of people who have died with wars, uh, related both to the numbers, increasing numbers of wars, as well as I think our efficiency in killing people, um, is in the neighborhood of, has been estimated in the last 50, 60 years to be about um, 400,000 people per year who've died in wars. Um, and if you look at who goes to war, you know, a lot of wars are these wars that, you know, happen between, you know, this, this group and another group, say, in sub-Saharan Africa or in Asia or Latin America. But actually, if you look at the 
the total numbers of wars, um, around 70 wars alone have been attributed to the United States, to the U.S. involvement overseas. Um, this is work that's been done by William Bloom. Um, and most of those wars have been, if you look at them, you know, some of them have been wars that you might say uh, have supported uh, uh, efforts to pacify certain countries, but for the most part, those wars have been fought to protect American corporate interests or our uh, friends of the elite status quo in countries where we've intervened. Um, and that suggests to us that the policies that push us to war are, in fact, policies that we can change, policies that are very specific to the interests of the rich and the powerful, and those are interests that really cut uh, precisely against the interests of the people of the United States or the people of the countries that they're uh, affecting. So it, it sounds like then that, that resources and, and wealth are uh, primary motivators, uh, at least in the last couple centuries, for the wars we've been seeing. Well, particularly with the United States. I think that there's no question that, that our military forces have been really, uh, you know, have been a tool of our expansionism, uh, our neocolonialism, and the whole process that we've used to make sure that America is safe for corporate interests. I think it's interesting when you look at um, the Marine Fight Song, one of my favorite songs when I was growing up, you know, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Well, you know, what was Montezuma? It was when we, you know, sent our Marines into Mexico to take over Mexico in 1848. What was the shores of Tripoli? The shores of Tripoli were when the Marines went to Tunisia to um, attack Tunisia um, to keep the Tunisians from supporting the Barbary pirates which were threatening our trade routes. Um, war has been used as a means of making, whether it's Asia, Latin America, uh, the Middle East, uh, or Africa, safe for American corporate interests, whether it's Iran, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's uh, Guatemala, whether it's countries in Africa. And since uh, Steve is talking about uh, Marines, uh, we should remember Smedley Butler, who is the most decorated uh, uh, war hero of the First World War, who said uh, that he was, a, that in a, he wrote a book <coughs> called War is a Racket, about 1936, saying, I was a racketeer for Wall Street. I was uh, basically there to protect U.S. capitalist interests. I was a, a gangster for capitalism. A gangster interest. for capitalism, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the other trends we've seen in the last couple hundred years is the uh, those who are casualties, direct casualties and, and indirect casualties of war has has shifted from where once upon a time it was primarily the soldiers uh, who were dying and now it's it's completely flipped where now it's primarily civilians that are the ones that are suffering. Right. That's, na that's now reached um, over 90% of the casualties are civilians in the world. And of those civilians who are killed, 99% are in poor countries. So, so ultimately what we're talking about are war on the poor of the world. And of course that fits with what we were talking about in terms of war being a tool to essentially perpetuate inequality. I mean, if you think about the, uh, the reason wars are fought, and particularly the reason that the United States gets involved in wars, is that war is one of the main tools for the rich and powerful to either establish or perpetuate their disproportionate hold over the resources of most countries of the world. And so when there's a threat to that disproportionate power, then, then war becomes a, a really effective tool uh, to make sure that it's not threatened. Um, and it's not just war. Um, we do it in a lot of different ways. We do it by assassinations. And if you look at the, the, the history of assassinations, we've been quite good or quite effective at assassinating. And torture is another very good tool to make sure that when people think about doing what, say, the Sandinistas did in Nicaragua or what Frilimo did in Mozambique, um, that there's a pretty substantial disincentive to do that because um, you know that either you'll be tortured, your family will be tortured, or the Americans are going to come in and either assassinate your leaders or, or overthrow the country. I think there's also been an interesting change in the spectrum of uh, military casualties over the last, say, 500 years ago. Uh, 
500 years. If you go back 500 years or in the Crusades, who led the charge? It was the Lord, the King, the leader. He was more likely, of course, to be, uh, to be slain. And, uh, and, and, the, and the peasants were sort of behind him because he led the charge. Who leads the charge today? You know, it's people sitting in a control room with a bunch of computers. And, uh, and so the casualties are lower class people, uh, not their leaders. If, 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 if it was our uh, presidents who led the charge into battle, uh, uh, then we'd have a, we, we might rethink war that way. But instead, it's now done from computer control rooms um, by drones and uh, and and um, and and, and uh, automated uh, weaponry uh, that is highly efficient and kills poor people. And also, it seems that paralleling that with removing, let's say, the soldiers further away from the, their targets, it seems that we as civilians here in this country are being further removed from what's going on uh, via a media that r refuses to show us images of the wars that we're engaged in. Or the images that we see um, either look at them from the standpoint of the troops um, or they romanticize war. And so I think that we really don't get a very good sense of what war does to us as human beings. I mean, I don't think, you know, when was the last time we did a, a This American Life sort of portrayal of uh, uh, what it feels like for a family, you know, to be the brunt of a war, um, and particularly a war that's either instigated or perpetuated or supported by the United States. We don't do that. I mean, our, our, our media typically doesn't question our foreign policy. It doesn't question what we do um, in a serious way. And, and war is entertainment. Uh, I was talking to somebody at the conference last night who said uh, when we invaded Iraq, he was in some other country and uh, he was staying in some hotel and the proprietor came and said, uh, you want to come and watch the war on television? <laughs> and, and that's what we do. You see war is entertainment. We watch it on TV just like we watch it on the movies. Uh, we don't think of the reality of it. Yeah, not to mention the, probably some of the most popular games, electronic games, video games, oh, right. are all based on war. There's another aspect to war where, I mean, we, we think about war as being um, a process by which, you know, huge uh, swaths of population, and as we've talked about, civilians, um, are, uh, are bear the brunt of war in terms of casualties and deaths. Uh, we talk about the destruction that war causes in terms of health infrastructure or health systems, infrastructure, etc. One of the things that we don't talk about very much with war, um, at least in my feeling, is that because war is a has been used as a tool um, to perpetuate, you know, as I've said, to establish or to maintain the interest of the rich. Um, I think we have to remember that. It's those same interests of the rich um, that oftentimes create and maintain uh, the conditions for poverty. And if you're looking at health and disease that are not related to war, at least we don't think are related to war, um, that health and disease are a function of poverty and there's nothing natural about poverty. And if you can make the point, which, I, which I'll try to do tomorrow, <laughs> if you can make the point that war is in fact a way of perpetu perpetuating um, inequalities and disproportionate, uh, 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 disproportionate uh, taking of wealth by the rich and powerful. What it means is that it makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to address poverty in terms of the kind of equity strategies that typically are done by countries where the rich and the powerful lose their hold on resources. It's very hard, for instance, for countries to do what China did, what Sri Lanka did, what many countries in the world have done in terms of taxing the rich to be able to pay for education, to be able to pay for health care, to be able to pay for basic subsidies for food. Uh, to be able to pay for water, sanitation, housing. And these are the things that affect health. And if you look at how we've improved health over the last, say, you know, half century, most of those improvements of health have come about from equity strategies that typically have come about when societies turn around and start redistributing the income. And the biggest impediment to that 
has been the rich and the powerful, and one of the biggest supporters for the rich and the powerful has been war, or threat of war. So I would make the point that war has much has a much bigger impact than the actual deaths from the war and the disruption from the war. It actually is a major factor that impedes us from those social justice, those equity strategies that are fundamental to improving health. My guess is that if you take the, you know, we've talked about 400,000 deaths per year as a result of war. Well, how about the 9 million kids every year who are dying? And over the last century, it's probably averaged about 12 million kids per year who die. You know, and if you could reduce that mortality rate through education, health care, and some of these other uh, factors, you'd save a lot more lives than even you're saving from war. But war makes it very impossible to address these issues because it keeps that inequality intact. So in a sense, we have two kinds of violence. What Steve has been describing is characterizing is the difference between behavioral violence, and war is a perfect example of that. You know, we go to battle, we drop an atomic bomb, we firebomb Tokyo, there's a smoking gun, uh, there's killings, it's obvious, it's discreet. And then there's structural violence, which is the violence, the injury, the death that comes about through the unequal structure of society. And, you know, the kids, the nine million kids that die, they die of diarrhea, of acute respiratory infections, of malaria, uh, not so many deaths in this country, but around the world. Uh, they die uh, in a continuous fashion. There's no fire bombing. There's no atomic bomb that's dropped. And, they, and, and there's no smoking gun. You can't point the finger at anybody. And um, one way of looking at structural violence is it's the perfect crime. You get away with murder. And murder on a much bigger scale than, than all the war deaths. If we look at the war deaths for the last uh, century, the 1900s, about 110 million. If you, if you make a calculation of structural violence deaths, now we don't, we don't have structural violence as a cause of death in, in the classification of diseases. But if we did, uh, one year structural violence deaths throughout the world might be 15 to 20 million. So in five or six years, you make up what the entire war deaths were last century. Uh, from, uh, and, and yet this is, this is unnoted. This is not seen as a violent death, structural violence. Paul Farmer has used this term structural violence. It came out of peace research about 40 years ago. You know, a couple of examples of that that are interesting. If you look at um, Vietnam, you know, Vietnam was a country that in the 70s was, was struggling. Uh, they were trying to develop their health and education systems, and we were fighting a war against the Vietnamese. And um, what the United States was doing is that we were supporting, particularly in the South, a government that really represented the, uh, the established status quo, the inequality of Vietnam. Um, and their mortality rates were pretty flat. That is, they weren't uh, going down, they weren't uh, reducing at all. As soon as the Vietnamese won the war and pushed the United States out, from 1975 until now, Vietnam, Vietnam has been the star of all of Asia and one of the stars of the world in terms of reducing mortality. Okay, now imagine, had we won that war, um, Vietnam wouldn't have done nearly as well because we can sort of look at the, at the 5, 10, 15 years prior to when the Vietnamese took over and, you know, those mortality rates probably would have fallen but by a little bit as opposed to the really rapid decrease in mortality that occurred as a result of a profound change in increasing equality, increasing education, increasing uh, the overall well-being of the population as a result of these equity strategies. And you could actually make estimates that X number of lives were saved simply by kicking the Americans out. One of the, uh, we have about five minutes left. Uh, part of your talks tomorrow is going to be talking about prevention of war. How do we um, prevent or inoculate ourselves as a society against war? Well, I think that there are a variety of structural ways of doing that. Uh, you know, I'm, I talked about the fire bombing, and bombing of Tokyo, and we were heroes in winning that war. So what do we do after we destroyed Japan? Well, we occupied it. And, uh, and our occupation was an amazing phenomenon that, that gave Japan the jump start it needed to become the healthiest country in the world. 
And one of the things we did was to say Japan cannot go to war. We wrote their constitution. And Article 9 says the, the Japanese shall never uh, go to wa wage war. They shall resolve all disputes peacefully. So one can write into a constitution that thou shalt not go to war. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, also Japan doesn't have an army. I mean, it has a, a police force. It, uh, it's increased in size, perhaps. Um, but, and, but you see, back in the 1940s, we actually thought that not going to war was, was a good idea for Japan. Now we want them to amend the Constitution to abolish Article 9 so they can go to war with us. So there's been an amazing about-face in, in, in our uh, international relations. But constitutional uh, statements about war, I think, would be appro one appropriate way if, uh, if we look at the evidence. Another would be to not spend money on the military. Uh, Costa Rica, for example, has no army, uh, no military. Uh, why can't we sort of, and, and we, of course, uh, have a huge military, uh, and, uh, and we sell a lot of weaponry all around the world, which is a very, a, a very big business. We sell, sell more weapons than every other country combined. Let me s suggest two other ways that we can reduce war. One is that um, we are we mean the United States, and then you add Russia and some other countries. Um, but the United States alone is the biggest small arms dealer and large arms dealer in the world. Um, there's no reason we can't begin to control the um, export of small arms. We're the ones that facilitate the, the wars that both we are instigate as well as the wars that are instigated by others. So by controlling that, uh, I mean, this is... A th we could have a huge impact, and, and what's going on with, with, with the arms sales is far worse than, say, uh, sales of cocaine or sales of drugs around the world. And then finally, I think what we really need is we need a clear history um, of what has happened in the past half century and probably century in terms of the United States' role in global wars. Um, you know, if, if we knew... If, if we as citizens knew that literally every couple of years that we go to war for one reason or another, usually justified in the sense of, say, national security, um, uh, but really wars that are fought, as I've said, you know, to either establish or to protect corporate interests, I think that people would probably take another look at, um, at the concept that we commonly draw of, say, the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan as aberrations of our foreign policy, because they're not aberrations. This is the, the, the standard. This is what we've been doing for years, and we really have to address some of those underlying reasons for our foreign policy. We also have to recognize that there are now only two superpowers in the world. One is obviously the United States with its massive military might and economic force. And the other superpower are the other six billion people in the world. You know, if you take the, the, the really powerful, they number a million or two or three, not very many. And the rest of us are a huge force. And so, you know, if we understood that war was not in our best interest, we, the huge superpower in the world, could actually mass together and... and, and uh, and war. And what's interesting is that people around the world know that many, many of these wars are fought in the name of the United States. We don't know that. You know, we're not, Americans typically, and I think because of the press to a large extent, are not typically aware of the fact that so many of these wars are in fact American wars. All right. Well, I want to thank you both very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike.